Let's start with the, the Indescript itself. In this talk, you will understand what the Indescript is, what its history, in terms of the decipherment and uh, everything else that has gone into it. Uh, how I deciphered it, uh, we'll look at some interesting uh, inscriptions. We will, uh, uh, hopefully you will get a good idea why this uh, decipherment is the, the correctness of the decipherment and what, what are the implications of the decipherment, what it means. So let's start. The Indescript is um, essentially the earliest inscription is the one you see here in the uh, top right here. This is on a shard of pottery and this has been dated to 3500 BC. So this is the earliest form of writing. If you look at uh, the other forms of writing, China is uh, 1200 BC, Egypt is 2800 BC, Mesopotamia is 3000 BC when the actual writing started. They had pre-writing, which was essentially a person uh, noting something for only his purpose, but the writing as a, as a society is something where one person can write something and someone else from some other part can easily read it. So, so as far as those dates are concerned, Indus writing is the oldest. If you look at the letters, they're already advanced. In this 3500 chart, it is already abstracted, which means that the writing probably started much earlier and based on Phoenician writing, the evolution of writing in uh, the Middle East and Semitic scripts, this would mean that the early writing actually was probably invented around 4000 BC. Uh, this writing lasted for a long time. It lasted uh, up to 50 CE. Uh, that is 50 years after uh, the new era in megalithic sites in South India. So uh, when you say there's Indescript, uh, you know, I'd like to say Indescript is everywhere. It's not just in Saraswati Valley. It was also found in um, Sanur in Tamil Nadu in a megalithic site. It's found in many megalithic sites. This is just an example I have uh, put here. Kizadi uh, recently we found both Indus signs and uh, Brahmi in the, in the same site in 600 BC and Chandraketu Ghad in West Bengal, uh, we see coins uh, from 300 BC. So those symbols on the coins are Indus uh, symbols. In Kutub Minar, we find uh, Indus scripts. In uh, Western Iran, in a site, we find uh, Indus scripts and also in uh, Bet Dwarka, we find th these inscriptions. So this, is, this script was very widely used. Uh, in a large region from uh, Iran to Saraswati Valley to Bengal and all the way south to Kiladi, which is uh, in southern India. So what is the Indescript problem? This script has been undeciphered more than 100 years. And many people say that it's the most deciphered script and with the most number of uh, languages. It has been deciphered as uh, Tamil, Sanskrit, uh, some people have tried to decipher it as a Middle Eastern language, and recently somebody deciphered it as Japanese. So uh, just because someone deciphered it, it doesn't give any kind of uh, satisfaction that, that it is the right one. It is because all decipherments are non-falsifiable. So someone just shows a, a, you know, a decipherment and said, hey, I figured it out. So there is no way to verify it. Decipherments also cannot be reproduced, like someone else cannot trace the path of a decipherment and recreate them. The other issue is that the classifications of the signs, they have, you know, various people have classified it between 360 and 720 signs. So Parpola has about 365, 370, something like that signs. And uh, Epigraphica has about 720 signs. But in reality, there are about 100 base signs and there are many composite signs, which means you know, two or more signs combined to create other signs. So it all depends on how uh, someone has classified them. So this is an example of what the, is the state of the decipherment, uh, what looks today. This is uh, Parpola and he deciphered it as Tamil. Uh, and if you see, he, he, the, his longest uh, deciphered inscriptions are only two letters long and he's deciphered about 24. 
and uh, it's very arbitrary. This uh, double circle he calls it as rings or bangles, and uh, the three strokes, uh, the three you know line strokes he calls them a hearth, uh, and uh, he uh, you know he uh, interprets it, it as pregnancy bangles. It's very arbitrary. Uh, I could, for example, um, interpret it as nuts and three knots and squirrel knots. It, it wouldn't, my uh, interpretation wouldn't be any better or worse than his. So this is essentially the state of uh, most uh, decipherments which uh, try to claim the decipherment is uh, logographic. Uh, this is S.R. Rao, he's an archeologist. He deciphered it as, as uh, Sanskrit. And the way he did that was he looked at all the signs. He looked at similar signs in Semitic scripts and he got about 15, 20 Semitic scripts, uh, symbols that look somewhat similar and he guessed the rest. This enabled him to decipher much longer um, scripts. If you can see there was five, six uh, symbols, uh, but still there are a lot of symbols that are undeciphered. Uh, so what is our approach to decipherment? One is we analyze the script, we try to figure out how to, uh, what, uh, what's the way to decipher it. And we find a proven and easy to understand method to decipher it. So the, the key is, uh, I didn't want to do a, something that is my own method because then I have to kind of prove the method. Uh, I wanted something that is well established and uh, there wouldn't be a lot of questions around it. The other criteria was that I wanted it to be easy to understand for people. The decipherment, I wanted it to be falsifiable. So science is uh, essentially a set of falsifiable statements. And if it's non-falsifiable, like if you saw Parpola's thing, then people will simply, uh, you know, anyone can just randomly create those things. It, it has no scientific value. So I wanted something that is, uh, someone could falsify. Right. So let's go to scripts. Um, if you look at the, the kinds of scripts that exist, broadly they are in uh, three. Uh, there are three types. One is uh, the first is logographic, which is Chinese. This is a random tweet, uh, you know, on a Weibo, which is a Chinese equivalent of Twitter. I just copied the Chinese, uh, and that is essentially it looks like this. You rarely see any repeated characters because every sign is a word. And in Chinese, for example, a single symbol is a word, as you can see here, the first symbol at the bottom here is, is Ren, which is a person. The second is Mu, which is wood. And the third, uh, you know, if you want to, to, to take a second to guess what it is, uh, go ahead. It's actually horse. And if, until I told you it's a horse, you probably you couldn't guess it. But after you, I tell you it's a horse, you can kind of say, oh yeah, it has four legs, it has a you know, hoof, whatever. So the, the point is it's very hard to guess what a symbol uh, is based on an abstract uh, rendition of it. So, you know, in, in many uh, Indus decipherments, you will see people saying, oh, this is a hoof. This is, a, you know, something else. This is a nut. This is a bangle. And from that, they do try to do a rebus. Uh, and because that there is no way to determine their first guess itself is correct the rest of the decipherment essentially is based on this first guess, which for, you know, in all probability is completely wrong. The second kind of script is a syllabic, and this is actually linear B. The, I've translated this exact tweet into Greek and I've rendered it in linear B. Linear B was a script uh, found in uh, a Greek island. And in the beginning, they, uh, all the scholars were pretty adamant that this cannot be Greek because of their hypothesis that Greeks were invaders and uh, you know, it, it, they brought the Greek language and the original language of that region cannot be Greek. Uh, but then uh, it was deciphered to be Greek based on uh, one of the words that was only found on the, that island. And the, it, it was a non-expert who guessed that this must be the name of the island. And from that guess of those two, th two or three letters, they were able to decipher the rest of the, the, the rest of the script. So linear B, uh, a syllabic script, essentially, as you can see in the central section here, has a symbol for a combination of a consonant and a vowel. So for example, here we have five in the, in the center here. 
which is a da de di do do and they uh, you know you cannot really guess that just by looking at it what syllable it stands for uh, and the last is uh, you know segmental or alphabetic and i have translated the same tweet into english and what you see here is that there are a lot of overlaps uh, there so there are a lot of repetitions of symbols it is very very easy to see like in memorize there are two m's in will there are two l's and so on it's uh, Uh, you also it's kind of obvious the latin alphabet abjads these are all considered segmental so in both segmental and syllabic you find common letters you find common endings so uh, you know here in i have highlighted in red in the syllabic uh, that actually stands for sa and the greek usually has a lot of words that end in s or os uh, and of course um, linear uh, b doesn't have a symbol for just s it only has for sa so when you write it down you write it as sa of course you see other symbols as well that have that are repeating i mean you, you could just glance at it you could just glance your eye on it and you could see that symbols repeat a lot now although this these are three you know high level group it is very normal to see repetitions of symbols in syllabic and segmental and um, when you know for example in uh, the linear b you see the letter s which is highlighted here it's a uh, sir and um, it exists because there is no word for s you have to use sir and that you see a uh, common endings uh, in syllabic because many languages tend to have endings in uh, certain common endings in many languages in many scripts you don't have you occasionally will have a combination of these so logographic will have, essentially have syllabic markers so chinese really is logo syllabic uh japanese for example uses chinese uh, letters they call them kanji and they also have uh, you know roman letters uh, they write letters in roman it's called romaji uh japanese itself has two entirely different systems of syllabic uh in uh, alphabetic systems you can use an emoji that you can consider as a logographic uh, character so there is no you know there's there's occasionally you will find some signs in a writing that are not purely uh, either syllabic segmental or logographic so that that's that's normal so let's move on to the next slide here if you look at indescript it's very clear there are a lot of repetitions you can easily see the fish sign you can see the square and uh, two um, numeric markers here that are you know that are repeating in many slides uh, in many inscriptions so it is um, very clearly it is either syllabic or segmental it is unlikely to be logographic logographic is essentially if you look at logographic you have a large number of symbols you have chinese has 6000 um, basic symbols it has over 40000 uh, you know actual symbols Uh, mayan language has 1250 or so symbols uh, you cannot really create a logographic language with as few as you know 100 to 300 symbols so this is why a lot of the symbol classifications tries to uh, stretch the symbol count to 700 or more and so that they can try to analyze it as a logographic in a segmental you usually have very few around 20 to 30 uh, for example the cyrillic alphabet is 33 uh, in syllabic uh, you can have essentially it, it is a matrix of uh, vowels and consonants so if you have 10 consonants and 5 vowels it's about 50 so uh, when you when now when we look at this it's very unlikely that this script is uh, logographic it is a uh, syllabic or segmental uh and how do you decipher a message that is just symbols so th- such messages are called cryptograms and people solve thousands of these every day so these are actual screenshots from twitter of people creating and solving uh, cryptograms so if you see uh here you know they have someone has uh, solved this welcome to moonwood mail and based on the pattern of os they have figured it as uh, moonwood if you look at the dictionary and try to find a word where the 
second, third, and the, you know the uh, two just before the last are uh, are the same letter. You actually find only one word. It's cookbook. Uh, but based on all the uh, characters, uh, you know the uh, people can figure out what they stand for. So this is called a cryptogram, and uh, this is a very well understood, you know, fun. It's like uh, you have crosswords and uh, so on in the newspapers. You also get cryptograms. Now, although this this is how cryptograms, uh, you know, can, can use any symbols, what usually happens is in newspapers and so on, they they don't create their own symbols. They just use a rearranged alphabet. But the uh, the problem is just the same. It's just uh, it's a lot easier to just rearrange an existing alphabet, or use numbers, or so on. Typically, in a cryptogram, it's a quote by a famous person. This example, this is from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and uh, so this is the cryptogram. The black is the actual puzzle. The blue is the solution. Now, how do you solve this? A lot of this is solved by trial and error. Uh, you know, people look at the short words and try to guess it's, it could be a E, B, 2, and so on. And then you know, there, there are ways to solve it. Uh, most uh, people who use regular expressions, what they do is they find a unique uh, pattern. In this example, I'm going to pick this word millennium. And uh, I'm going to pick this, you know, B, B, R, R. You know, it's a double repetition in a word and I can try to solve it using something called a regular expression. So people who are not in the uh, programming world, uh, the, you know, for, for their benefit, I'm just going to explain what a regular expression is. It's essentially a pattern of letters where you can capture the position of each letter and you can refer to it. So here, uh, the dot, dot, dot here in parentheses become one, two, three. And here when I do backslash three, it just says I'm repeating this letter. So here, if you see L-O-B-B, -B, I'm repeating the second B here. And so on here in all the way to slash one, which is the same as the letter L. And I am looking at up here in a cornucopia dictionary, cc.txt is a cornucopia dictionary. And I see that there's only one word that matches it and it's millennium. So once I uh, decipher this, I can look at all the characters, all the words which have only one letter missing. So for example, here, B-H-N, if I do the similar analysis and I find this is let, so N is T, then I can go to here and put the T and now I just have to guess X and then I could guess this as minutes. So this QX becomes as and so on. So this is how you do it. This, is, uh, this has been uh, in the pub, you know, this is public domain since I think at least 10 years in the Perl community. Perl is a programming language for text manipulation. This has been known for over uh, you know, 10 years. So now the, the reason I chose this is because a long cryptogram, more than 100, years, 100 uh, letters, is considered unsolvable in two different ways. So you cannot take this and solve it in a different way. Like you cannot use, uh, get some other message out of this, anything meaningful. Even meaningless you cannot get, you cannot, you cannot find other words that fit this for the same um, values of the symbols. It's just, it's just uh, highly improbable. Now let's try to uh, see how you would do it with short words because in, uh, in the scripts you have, uh, you know, you don't know where the word boundaries are, there's no spacing. So uh, we will try to solve this in our own made up cryptogram. So here you have these two words and uh, they have, you know, you know, the first two symbols here and the first two symbols in the second one, you're trying to find the value of the anchor symbol. So the way you would do that is you would uh, use the regular expressions and find what matches uh, this pattern. So the two words that match T and H are, are the and die, and the four words that match A and N are these. So that means this anchor symbol must be the intersection of these two sets, E and Y and A, D, T, Y. And that happens to be Y. So you have deciphered it as any and die. So this, this is essentially it, it very, it's very simple. Uh, now what happens if this intersection doesn't produce a unique value? Well, you need to get one more, you know, one more piece and then do an intersection over and over and over again. So this is the formalization. As I said, this is a pre-existing uh, technique. This is not something I've invented, but I've just written it formally. The only difference is here, instead of the dot, which represents one letter, we are doing dot plus, which means we are taking a whole string of letters. 
this will enable us to capture both uh, segmental, syllabic, and occasional logographic characters. So it won't matter to us what kind of script it is, as long as it's not purely logographic. So if you look at the signs, you can see that the signs have evolved over 1500 years. So from starting from 3500 to around 1900 BC, uh, and you can see the abstraction, you know, so it gets more and more abstract. It's initially, it's, it, they took a lot of effort to make it very detailed to look like an, uh, you know, an animal as a horse in this case. And as time passes, they make it more and more abstract. And eventually it doesn't even look like a horse. So now when industry people try to, the, the scholars who try to solve it, try to classify it, it is very arbitrary. So for example, all of these, are considered the same symbol. And uh, the, the real issue is that every rendition, every uh, instance of a symbol is hand carved and it's as unique as every person's handwriting. So it is very, uh, you know, there is no real way to uh, be objective or worried because it's not a print, it's not a printed uh, system. And if you look at Parkola's classification, you know, the number 81, the second symbol and the fifth symbol and the last symbol, he considers them all the same, but he considers the second symbol in 80 different from the last symbol in 81, which is very odd because they only differ in the curvature of the last two legs, you know, the, the ends of the last two legs. So he focuses, uh, he gives more weightage to that rather than everything else here. So um, now are they really different? If you look at modern writing, if you look at the different kinds of A's you can write here, highlighted in red on the, on the left side, you can write it in many ways and your brain automatically figures out what this letter is. So, uh, you know, a, a curvature at the bottom, it doesn't actually, you, you don't really give way to it. Human cognition essentially looks at the whole shape uh, and, uh, you know, gives a, uh, uses that as a symbol. So in, in our example here, the symbols from 286 to 304, they're essentially the same symbol because they have the same kind of decoration. So, you know, they, they have a little numeric stroke, you know, uh, or two strokes or three strokes and uh, or, or none as in a 301 and the same way above here. And that is unique to this. Uh, particular shape. So we can uh, classify it as the same symbol. But in reality, you don't want to uh, uh, do, do the real classification until after you decipher it. You can use things that are very close as a symbol. And you can bank on the fact that if you look at these symbols here on the top right, that there's so much freedom for, the, uh, for Indus, uh, uh, you know, uh, inscriptions to create signs. Uh, you know, they've created so many signs that they don't have to worry about uh, creating unique signs based on tiny variations. So they, the signs themselves are designed to be, they have a lot of freedom in uh, rendition in individual instances. So, uh, you know, it is obvious that 80, uh, you know, the first and the last signs are so different yet they are the same because they don't have to focus on little things like a line here and a line there. Now, what if the sign identifications are wrong? What if you know, there is something like CNG that look kind of same, but they really are different? And what if the signs that look different are really the same, like this, this A and the, the, this uh, script A? Uh, and what if one of the signs is deciphered incorrectly? You, you see how in our system, we are deciphering one sign and then using the decipher to decipher the other sign. What happens if one of them is deciphered incorrectly? So in, in the cryptogram method, what will happen is the regular expression will stop matching and your decipherment will hit a dead end and you have to restart from, this, uh, from scratch. So it is a self-correcting method. If something is wrong, it will simply not go anywhere. You will not get any matches in the dictionary. So imagine in the word millennium, you change one of the letters and try to match it. You will get zero results. That's basically what happens. Now, what language to try? What language could it be? You have to guess the language. So all of this works if you know what the language is. So the, the right thing to do is try all languages and see whatever is right, it'll fit. 
So uh, what languages did ancient India have? It had Sanskrit, it had some form of the Vedian. Although we say Old Tamil, it, it really uh, could be closer to Tulu, which is a language in uh, Karnataka. Nihali, which is uh, isolate, it's unlikely uh, isolate is a language, but uh, is a language of such a large area. So, but you could try that. Burishaski is also an isolate in the mountains in uh, Himalayas. These are the only language groups in uh, India that are native. The other languages, uh, Munda and all came later in Orissa and so on. So how do we do that? We uh, start with two signs and uh, you know, just like in a cryptogram, you have to guess a couple of signs. There are various ways to guess it. Could be brute force, could be just uh, you know, trial and error. And I have guessed it, it's in my paper, my reasoning for guessing. It doesn't matter how you guess it, because if you're wrong, you will, you'll just have to restart it. So uh, we start with this and uh, we uh, go one by one and this is uh, how we proceed. So for example, here, using the the and the and using these three uh, inscriptions, we figure out that this sign is un. And now you have the un and the the and the, you can figure out that the, the person symbol actually is a. Now you have a and the, you can figure out this uh, symbol is e and so on. So you can proceed like that and you uh, do it one by one. The key is that you should not, you should only use the previously deciphered signs to decipher a new sign. If you see an, any number here that is greater than the next one, then it's a circular reference. Such a decipherment is not valid. So uh, what you see is over 1500 years, a lot of uh, changes happen to individual signs. Rotation is very common. It is because the inscriptions need to conserve horizontal space. So the uh, some symbols get rotated. And in this particular case, uh, even for vertical space, it got uh, the, the neck got rotated. Uh, they get abstracted. So this is an elephant head, this tusk and trunk and the head and the ears of the elephant. Over time, they get abstracted to just the trunk and uh, tusks. So how do we know these are all the same? We simply uh, determine them, we prove them individually. So here is the actual uh, unabstracted portion. And then, uh, you know, every stage we try to solve it. And when we line them up together, you kind of see uh, the, that it has abstracted over time. So once you have the symbol, we can look up the dictionary and try to find a word that starts with that letter that kind of looks like that shape. And these are the things I have found that kind of look like it. There, in some cases, there's uh, more than one word, like for fish, there is Mina as well. Uh, but in many other cases, uh, you know, this is the only obvious word for it. Now, if you try to arrange them instead of the order by which we decipher it, if you arrange it by the sound itself, this is what you see. And uh, for the same sound, what you see is that the words are very, very close. So for th, you know, starts with tardula drum becomes tardula, then tandula, and then tala. So this. Uh, and similarly, for Bakshatra, Bakshapatra and Bakshatra. And Madara Masta, which is elephant head, eventually becomes Mastya and then Maya, which is horse. So apparently what's happened is that these symbols have been orally transmitted and they, got, they get a little mutated, they get a little changed. And that is why you have so, so many symbols. And the base symbols turn out to be only 81. And then there are um, uh, comp composites. Composites essentially are read as it's a, it, it started as a space saving mechanism because there's not a lot of horizontal space. So they started writing it uh, one below the other. And you just read it as two symbols. It's, it's very simple to read uh, uh, composite symbols. So some symbols are decorated, uh, you know, like if we saw these, uh, these line strokes. And usually it's uh, three or four line strokes. This is the most uh, one to four line strokes. This is the most uh, common way of decoration. And uh, what they do is, uh, what it does is these are found typically at the beginning of the inscriptions. And this is a way to indicate that the inscription is read from either left to right or right to left. Uh, most of these, almost all of these are on the right side, which is the first symbol. And occasionally they're in the center. And at that time, it is a word boundary marker. 
So once you have the symbols, once we deciphered all the symbols, if you, you may have already seen that the, some of the symbol, signs are very uh, close to the Brahmi symbols. So if you arrange them by the same sounds, not by the way the symbols look, but just by the way, uh, you know, this ga is uh, the ga for Brahmi, this is the ja for Brahmi, uh, you know, old Brahmi. And these are the, on the right, bottom right, these are the symbols for Indus. If you just arrange them, this is what you see. And what you see is pretty much every symbol is not even a derivation, it's almost an exact symbol from Brahmi, uh, from Indus. All Brahmi symbols, except you know the E here, seem to have come directly uh, from Indus. So now let's look at some uh, interesting inscriptions. So this is the longest inscription. This is a copper plate found in um, what's today Pakistan, but it's in uh, the Indus region. It's the longest script. When we transcribe it, you essentially, what you get is a uh, words in uh, Ushnik 7 into 4 meter. Uh, Ushnik 7 into 4 is a post Rigvedic meter. Uh, Rigvedic actually, so any 28 letter shloka, you know, words can be Ushnik. Uh, but the, usually it is, uh, the 74 doesn't appear in Vedas, it appears post-Vedas in the Puranic times. So, uh, so this is what you see, it's, it's essentially a prayer to Soma, Soma and Sun. The second one you see here below is the longest seal. This has uh, around 27 signs, and this happens to be a meter in a variant of Gayatri, it's 6 into 3, it's a, a prayer to uh, the sun. Dolavira signboard. The normal rendition of this is uh, flipped, but this is the actual, uh, this is the correct way to read it. It's read from uh, right to left, and it essentially says, uh, Raka Vararaka Araras, which means a diamond gem entrance. So the Raka is a, Vararaka is a diamond, Raka is a, a crystal. So you could just call it diamond entrance, uh, but this is, this is what it reads. This is a Magala coin. And uh, you could read this as Rayaka, which is a synonym of Ravaka, which represents a weight of 1.2 grams. And Magadha coins is, uh, its weight is about three Rayakas. Uh, there's no inscription here, but there's a picture of a black book. And uh, as you guys probably are aware, the region where the black book roams is known as the, the land fit for sacrificial act. So, Apparently, the Indus people were, you know, even in those days, this uh, uh, this sentiment was there. So this is uh, essentially Usha Tamra, which is a coppery red dawn. I just uh, is not, uh, uh, you know, the it's very it's a very beautifully carved uh, rhinoceros. And uh, one of the signs we have in one of the seals we have in uh, uh, great detail and color. Uh, so this particular inscription has a chariot with spoked wheels on a yoke. So uh, the, the, it reads Rai, but the, the more important thing here is the fact that a spoke chariot with the yoke was very, very old. Uh, this is some, sometime around 2500 BC. Uh, this reads, uh, reads uh, Pani Dharana, essentially wedding. So they, the, that concept of uh, Pani Dharana as wedding existed back in around, you know, between uh, around 2500 BC. This is, uh, the, on the left, it reads Yajas, which is uh, the word for Yajam. And on the right, uh, Shashamani, which is essentially, uh, Shashamana is a uh, person who's performing the Yajna, and Shashamani is the deity that's been worshipped in the Yajna. Uh, this is the famous uh, uh, Pashupati seal, and it reads uh, Ashasana Mana, which means prayer of uh, the animal sacrifice. So uh, this uh, this essentially seems to be associated with the Ashwamedha Yajna, where all these animals are sacrificed. Uh, now this is a, this is a look at uh, various uh, symbols used in uh, in the script, and a lot of them seem to be inspired by the altars, Vedic altars. So this is the falcon altar, and this name of the symbol is Shashada, which is a falcon. This is uh, Udbata, which is a uh, turtle, and uh, so on. This is Chakra, and you know, this, this is called Ratha Chakra anyway. So uh, there seems to be, they have borrowed these because they, uh, you know, they're 
they, that's what they're familiar with. That's what is recognizable. So there are a lot of uh, Indian deities mentioned in the inscriptions. Uh, so the left is, uh, it says Ravi Riva, which is Sun Shiva, which could mean Sun is Shiva. On the right is, uh, it's just a long inscription. It's essentially, it mentions the sun and uh, Indra. Uh, Varana is a name for Indra. Uh, name for Vishnu also exists. Shasana, uh, like uh, Vishnu exists as a protector of the sacrifice and so on. So now we've seen all this. The question is, you know, how, how do you know it's correct? The successfully being able to read so many inscriptions itself is proof of, uh, it should be sufficient proof of correct de decryption. But if you look at the probability of a single pair of signs giving a two-syllable word everywhere, it's only, it's 38%. Uh, so if you, uh, at the bottom here, if you look at, hey, what, how many words can I have next to a ka? There are 11 words, like a two-syllable word. And out of the total 29 uh, basic signs, when you divide it, it comes to around, it comes to 38%. And the probability of uh, two pairs is essentially the square of that. The probability of n pairs is 0.38 to the power n. Uh, so when you have a lot of words, when you have, when you have deciphered around you know, 500 letters, it becomes infinitesimally small. It becomes like a hash collision. So one in one followed by 100 zeros, something like that. So when... Um, when you see a word like this, some Sharanagata, seven symbols, is very, very, very unlikely to occur by randomly assigning variables. So you saw um, the other decipherments only working with two symbols. So finding something that is seven symbols is extremely unlikely, just even one word. Uh, those are measurable probabilities. These are unmeasurably small probabilities, right? So the, the fact that you can read 50 inscriptions is measurable to one in, uh, you know, 10 to the power of, uh, uh, you know, 100. But reading them meaningfully. So that was just reading them as random words, but this is reading them meaningfully in a one theme. Like, you know, it's a theme about, uh, you know, it's a religious theme, it's prayer to the sun and all of this. Reading all of them in the same theme is unmeasurably small. I cannot even measure how small this is. You know, it requires an expert in probability to uh, figure that out. And uh, by the technique we have done, getting a nearly 100% match between Brahmi and this is again, it's unmeasurably small probability. It, it cannot happen by design or accident. And uh, the fact that you have something in meter, when you, uh, you know, did it sign by sign uh, and it resulted in uh, words in meter, this is again, very, very tiny probability. It's just unmeasurably small probability. Now I had some criticisms from, from people who read it. And one of them, they said, is, you know, the syntax is of the language is, it doesn't have the right uh, way bhakti and so on. Uh, this is actually uh, their own claim on the language of 2600 BC, based on their knowledge of 1500 BC and 600 BC uh, grammar. So this, this essentially is their own claim. It's not a criticism. And some, you know, there are some, um, before it was deciphered, people had claims over, you know, the frequency of this letter has to be this much and so on. Uh, frequency changes over time. So we know from the Bible, over a thousand years, the frequency of letters has changed, new letters have come up, old letters have been dropped and so on. And that is not something you can do before a decipherment because they don't know which symbol represents what. So for example, ta has four symbols. And if you count them as individually different symbols, then any analysis, analysis you do on that is, is pointless. It, it doesn't have any value. Uh, the one of the other criticism I've said is, well, hey, this sign actually is a different sign. And, and again, I say the same thing. You cannot make that before decipherment. It's all these are not uh, criticisms. They're all uh, claims. And uh, the method itself, as I said, it's uh, not my own. It's already existent. The actual decipher, the step by step, you see the, the where every sign is deciphered. No one has made any um, uh, you know, uh, criticism or uh, refutations of those. So that's that's what the situation is. So uh, is this falsifiable? So falsifiability is very important because that proves that something like this is a science. And something that you can, 
coat and build on for um, you know other new other uh, contributions so what anyone can do to falsify this is take another dictionary so i have taken the sanskrit dictionary but you can take any other dictionary english or arabic or uh, korean japanese anything and follow the same steps you can indeed follow the exact same sequence of symbols that i have solved and then try to create similar um, Think, uh, good explanation as to why there are allograms. So like we saw with Tandula and so on. Yes, uh, Ji, you your audio went off for uh, about a minute. Could you just repeat the last four or five lines again? Sure. So the way to refute this is very simple. Uh, take any other dictionary and try to re-decipher the symbols in that language. So you just need a dictionary and you need a weekend. And you can try to prove that this actually, you know, this, this doesn't work. Uh, I can create uh, something similar in a different language. And uh, uh, in such a decipherment, you should have values for uh, all the symbols. You should have a good explanation for the allograms, which is, uh, you know, like you saw for the, you had tardula, tandula, and so on. You need a, a good uh, explanation as to why all these symbols have the same sounds. You need to be able to read the longest 50 inscriptions meaningfully, not just like donkey moon bark. It's you know it has to be, uh, it has to be meaningful to the reader, uh, and uh, you know it would be good if the largest uh, inscriptions are in some kind of classical meter. If it's Arabic, it has to be in classical Arabic meter, uh, and so on. You know, religious. So essentially, something that looks like this. Then uh, you know, then you can say it's falsified, uh, and people have tried it. Uh, they could not move beyond two or three signs in any other language. So uh, I just like to discuss the implications of this decipherment. Um, the first implication is that IE languages originated in the Indian subcontinent because we uh, know that this writing is invented around 4000 BC. It's definitely attested from 3500 BC. So whatever happened in you know steps or wherever in 2000 BC, in, you know, it's irrelevant. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, impact us anymore. Uh, we also see from the references to, you know, Vedic concepts, the deities and so on, that the culture is continuous from uh, IVC, whenever IVC was uh, reasonably urbanized. I, I'm putting a conservative date of 7,000 BC, it could be earlier. Uh, we know Harappan civilization is Vedic related. Uh, and one more thing is uh, the in the derivation, you guys really should read the paper for more details. We cannot pack everything in here. But the couple of symbols, the un symbol, the jar symbol, it is essentially a proto anaswara, right? And we see that in the Kutub pillar uh, inscription. Uh, instead of uh, pramshu, it's written pransu. So that usage of uh, uh, un as the Anuswara instead of um existed at, at, until the time the you know Kutub inscription was made. So you see a lot of attestations for the indescript in many places, and uh, all of them are pretty much uh, you know they uh, support uh, this decipherment. So at this point, uh, I think we can open it for questions. My question is actually with regard to what I feel is also might be a, a serious implication, the connections that you've drawn between the um, symbols that you have uh, seen and deciphered in this valley with Brahmi. That connection is actually, I feel, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I feel that might actually help also bridge this whole Aryan Dravidian divide issue. Uh, which tries to show Aryan Dravidian North South as separate and so on, rather than as as uh, you know simultaneous or uh, contiguous. So my question is one: uh, Have you done any additional work on this on the on the Brahmi aspect? And two: What is the current research going on? Is there uh, like in official circles, uh, you know, and by the official bodies and concerned uh, people, more work going on to decipher and to draw connections and linkages, um, so that we get a complete picture of our civilization? 
that's All right. Uh, so uh, yeah, the Brahmi is um, and so essentially Brahmi is standardized in this. Uh, and as you saw in uh, Kiladi, the both uh, writing systems were involved. And essentially what happened was the language changes. So in the original Indus language, we believe that the, uh, you know, the aspirations and the unaspirated had not yet differentiated. The retroflex had not differentiated. And over time it differentiated and they had to standardize the symbols and give different, uh, uh, values, different signs for different values. Uh, and the, so, so that is, as far as the industry Brahmi is concerned, I don't really see Brahmi as anything other than standardizing symbols because they are exactly the same symbols, except for like E and U, everything else is exactly the same symbol. Uh, secondly, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, South India and so on, there is work being done by Igor Tonyan Balayev who posits that the Dravidian branch separated from Indo-European very early, went to Central and South India, and then it re-emerged. And that is why it is so similar in terms of phonology, grammar, the noun cases, really everything, the, even bar, you know, uh, borrowings. Uh, so I think that is, um, a lot of that has been kind of, uh, has been given supporting evidence by my dec uh, decipherment. I'm sure that more work will go on. I will also be doing some work to look into that. Recently, there's a lot of genetic evidence that supports this, uh, this particular view. So essentially, just like, you know, say, let's say uh, Kannada split into two or three uh, dialects, like uh, there's North Karnataka and South Karnataka. So if that happens for a long time, then you will see um, differences. So language group itself is a very uh, long discussion. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but just to give a short summary, language groups require a long, long time of isolation, more than 10,000 years. So we know that because of Japanese and uh, North and South American languages, it, took, uh, it takes around 20,000 years. So Dravidian is not isolated long enough to be that different. That is why we find so many similarities. It's only been isolated for like four, five thousand years. So uh, I, you know, I wouldn't say that it's different. It's just a, uh, it's just a different. It's just sufficiently different that you can try to make a claim it's a different language sound, but it's not. It's not really that. I'm sorry, I forgot your uh, second question. Is someone else doing research? Yes, uh, a lot of a lot of research is occurring on uh, Indescript. I don't believe that you can have any other value for any other letter than what I've done simply because it is probably correct. And if you change, maybe the letters that don't have high frequency, there are some symbols that occur for, you know, five to five times, four times, those you may be able to find a different value that still fits meaningfully. But anything that occurs 10 times, if you change it, uh, try to use a different letter, um, most readings will break. They will either, you won't be able to create words or the words will become meaningless. It will be like dog moon bark, you know, it, it just it won't make any sense. So I have two questions. The first one is that uh, you have guessed with this ta and da. So, I mean, how is that possible? And the thing is that, what about numbers? So this very important point in SRO's inscription, there were three things, ananan, that you, that you deciphered as ananan. But it could have been also five, 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 or something like that, right? So it is so. So the numbers are completely absent from this uh, decipherment. Uh, don't why is that? And the and the and the last question is a little bit technical. That thirty-eight percent. How did you derive that? I probably missed it. But the more important question is what about numbers and how did you get the initial guess? Okay, so uh, numbers and uh, initial guess. These are your two questions. So. Uh, Numbers, essentially, what we saw is that the numbers just use their first sound of the number. Uh, and, you know, that's essentially what they did. And the way it evolved is that uh, when they started running out of space, they started trying to create symbols at the end of the inscriptions that can stand for uh, more complex sounds. So for V, they used... Uh, two marks 
which which is v is two in uh, Sanskrit. And once they started that, then for the sake of consistency, they started using other uh, numeric signs to stand for their own uh, values. Have they uh, written any uh, things that are like number? Yes, they they do have eka. Uh, like there's a there's an inscription which says dada eka padu, which means gift of Shiva. And there they have eka, but it's spelled out as a and ka. Uh, that, that's the first one. Second one, initial guesses. Uh, initial guess actually it's a, a pretty complicated thing. Uh, the first one is if you look at uh, the and the, they are essentially identical to Brahmi. So you can just guess based on that. And the initial guess, as I said, doesn't matter. You could do it through brute force or anything else. But in the paper, what I've uh, explained is there's a sign, there's an inscription that says Dada uh, Dada Danta, which is uh, thunder sand. You can read it as Dada Danta. You can read it any way uh, you want. It doesn't matter because all you need is a way to guess the first symbol. Okay. Uh, so uh, essentially, that's what I've done. And uh, Ananan, the reason I've done Ananan is that it, it is actually uh, also a kind of um, a prayer. It's actually kind of, a, uh, you know, it sounds like something that someone would write as a laudatory thing. Uh, and the 38% essentially is, if you look at, if you look at the, any random symbol and you give it any value, and the chances of a neighboring symbol matching a word, not a meaningful word, just a word, is simply the number of available words with the, that letter in that position with the number of symbols. So if you divide them, so roughly it comes to around 38%. So in some cases it's much less, it's 5%, 2%, 1%. And uh, one or two places it is more, it can be 40 or 41%. But I would be, you know, as a kind of a general measure, as a kind of a conservative measure, I've taken 38%. So uh, my first question is, have you made an attempt to reach out to academia, at least in India, to get their views on it? Because somehow, uh, I mean, this has to, become mainstream this, this is such a big big break, breakthrough and uh, i had a second question about the indo-european homeland so how did you conclude from this decipherment that india is the indo-european homeland because that could still be further back in time right so even if you're saying that 4000 bc we have these scripts it could still further be back in say 6000 bc because that's the theory of max planck institute 6000 bc iran so how did you conclude that yeah thanks yeah first about academia yes i have reached out to uh western academia and as I said, their objections are essentially claims. And uh, they have not actually, apparently, I was pretty disappointed they didn't actually read the paper or understood it. They didn't uh, seem to understand what a cryptogram is, why the initial guesses can be you know, brute force or arbitrary. Uh, they did not essentially find an issue with the decipherment, but they found issue with Things like, you know, why would they write this? You know, things like that. It's just completely, essentially dictating how, what the Indus people should write. And, uh, you know, they're upset that it's Sanskrit. And, and they, they don't understand that, you know, you have to try every language and the language that fits is works. So, and these are prestigious journals and uh, the reviewers didn't, didn't really seem to understand, uh, you know, the paper itself. So that, that is one. The second is uh, Indian the thing. I will certainly uh, approach them as I'm not an academic. I don't care about uh, academic glory or anything like that. I, I just, you know, this is just a nice, difficult problem for me to solve. And once I've solved it, I put it out there. I, you know, I, I want to let the universe take over, but we will try to promote this uh, among the people by creating, um, you know, automated uh, translations, uh, you know, uh, software that can automatically automatically translate and so on. So because then it's it's pretty much obvious that it's a uh, it's a real disciple. Uh, and your other question was about uh, homeland uh, and homeland. See, the homeland question really requires input from multiple streams of uh, multiple dis disciplines of science. Okay, so linguistics is one, and this is a very solid proof. And this by itself, I think, is enough. But there's also work being done on uh, DNA, and it's uh, based on this David Reich's uh, uh, database of DNA and what it appears to be preliminary, I just want to say it's preliminary, is that the migration into Europe took place from uh, BMAC, bacteria marginal complex. 
and uh, uh, you know we're still working on that the, you know there's a team working on that when i say we it's not me but there's a team working on that and when once that becomes a little more mainstream maybe we can have another talk and uh, discuss those may questions uh, if you how uh, might uh, forgive my illness uh, one is uh, i i um um you talked about a few long inscriptions that you kind of like uh, deciphered is that the limited amount of long description uh, long inscriptions available in harappa i uh, do we have more that is kind of not accessible to you or uh, or is it, is that all so that's the first question the second uh, question i have is in terms of language you know um grammy was used to write uh, not uh, just sanskrit but also other languages and all of that so in terms of language is is this uh, from this are you able to make out okay uh, is are these inscriptions closer to uh, vedic uh, language or uh, the later classical sanskrit language because I, from this i'm not able to actually make out either so i just thought uh, i'll get your opinion on that right All right so the number of inscriptions these are the longest the as i said the the first you know the, the first two are uh, long enough that they are actually uh, verses and generally after that you have you know between you know 20 something to you know 10 uh, symbols and the top 50 are around uh, after you cross the, the longest 50 it's it's around nine symbols nine signs per uh, inscription so we don't have a long uh, a lot of long inscriptions if we had long inscriptions it would have been a lot uh, e- you know it would be a lot simpler to decipher it but we have short inscriptions and fortunately because we have so many short inscriptions we can use a regular expressions method and uh, your second question is about brahmi uh, does it mean so a script can be used uh, you know with modifications for any language so you see cuneiform was used for greek it was used for semitic scripts it was used for uh, you know hittite uh, similarly if you have latin it is used for european languages both uh, southern european and northern european and it's used in vietnamese and so on uh, even for turkish now uses uh, so script doesn't imply that you know it's it's uh, from the same language family or anything like that it's uh, just a technology and uh, people who don't have the technology will simply borrow the technology one thing i want to know is there any study made uh, whether these uh, symbols uh, are quite matching with the other contemporary civilizations of that time is there any uh, similarity in symbols right, right. no there's for indus symbols i think there there have been studies indus symbols are so varied there's I, you know you can find two or three symbols that match uh, something in uh, egyptian or something in uh, uh, phoenician or something like that but in the semitic scripts most of the the number of symbols is only about 22 23 whereas in indus you have depending on the classification you have you know 100 to 700 you know depending on how you classify it. so there is no real point in comparing it but yes uh, the the basic geometric stuff you find everywhere you know line circle uh, like something like a wheel something like a fork uh, those those are very common things that all uh, you know populations will uh, you know use so there is uh, so even for example in linear b you have that some symbols that look like you know indus symbols but the, i don't think that is uh, in any way meaningful so my question concerns first of all a, uh, a pretty nice talk now wh- why is it that we have so many uh, like distinct symbols for representing the same syllable for example for ka or kha you have given 15 for na i can see there are 10 now in in scripts that do have such a multiplicity let's take for example the sumerian cuneiform or the egyptian hieroglyphs that's because they used to be ideograms or pictograms which then later uh, got adopted for their sound value so could we posit something similar for um right yeah i, I already discussion. covered that right i already covered that in the talk essentially the 
there are two forces here. One is the allograms themselves. The other is the variants of an allogram. The allograms occurred because the names of the allograms were transmitted orally and got mutated, right? So, you know, Tardulia became Tardula and Tardulia is a drum. Tardula is a, a fighter or a warrior. So that's why you have two, uh, you know, signs for it. And then over time, over 1500 years, there are, uh, you know, the signs got more and more abstract. So they became uh, different. So that is why you have so many sounds for it. And uh, some of the signs essentially got mirrored, okay? Because when you carve a, a seal, you are carving the mirror of it. And sometimes if you forget to carve the, uh, the mirrored image, if you forget to carve the mirrored image, then, um, you know, th that, that becomes another sign. So that is essentially how you got so many signs. You mentioned in your talk, the Semitic uh, family. It, does it include the Aramaic and the Phoenician on which in the internet it says the Brahmi script was modeled and uh, the Indus Valley script and the Harappan script, are they coterminous? Are they referring to the same script? Yeah, I couldn't follow the question completely. There's, there's no relation between Semitic scripts and uh, Indus script. Indus script precedes uh, all the Semitic scripts by a few hundred years. I'm sorry, what's, uh, what's the other question? See, the Aramaic was the uh, language in which, script and language in which the Bible was, the first Bible was compiled. Right. Is the, the, uh, when you scroll across the internet, it says Brahmi was modeled on the Aramaic and the Phoenician. Yeah, that's an, uh, that's an unattested uh, statement. It's a guess. Correct. And, uh, and uh, you know, if you look at how they have... Uh, claim the evolution if you if you make sufficient changes to a symbol like four or five stages of changes you can derive any script from any other script but if you look at the indus symbols and the brahmi symbols you don't have to do any changes they are pretty much identical with just minor rotation and so on is it i'm working or help trying to help dr kalyan ramanji at in chennai who's done a great job in deciphering of Indus Valley script. Are you in touch with him by any chance? We have tweeted on, uh, you know, we have tweeted at each other, yes. Okay, just wanted to know, I'm trying to look, find some people on artificial intelligence and machine learning who could help him decipher, because he has already done about 8,000 words of the, of the Indus Valley, uh, you know, script so is it uh, so i'm trying to see if there's somebody out there who's interested in that right so uh, kalyan's uh, decipherment is logographic and as i said he looks at a thing and says oh this is a this is a hoof and it sounds like this therefore it sounds like thin so this this kind of stuff is completely non falsifiable and it's very arbitrary and anyone could claim that anything looks like anything and that that anything sounds like something else and therefore that stands for the symbol so this such a such a decipherment has no value without a rosetta stone which confirms that this symbol uh, you know is the same value because of uh, it is written into common language so I, I i would you know that's not an approach that i find is scientific 